Hey, welcome for joining us today. Welcome for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, on Wednesday, January 13th, 2021, the new release of Jenkins LTS was, was released. That is 2.263.2. And in today's show, we are going to talk about a number of the updates that were there. And are you new here? If you are, thanks for joining us today. And if you are new, you don't know who I am. My name is Darren Pope. I am a developer advocate for CloudBees. And today I am joined by, joined by with, my prepositions are toast today. I'm joined with, what am I, should, what, who, who are you? We're here and I'm Mark Waite. <laughs> wow, okay. It would be so much easier if I actually knew what I was doing, right? You're doing great, okay. Darren. This is wonderful. Okay. Okay, so by the way, Mark is the Jenkins Documentation Officer. Did I get it right today? You did, that's right. I'm the Jenkins okay. Documentation one. Officer. I got one thing right. All right. Well done. So for everybody, if you're if you haven't upgraded yet, you might want to listen to us first. Mm -hmm. Just like any time. You should probably always check things out before upgrading. But here's the big deal. This is just the dot two release. So not a lot of big changes in this release. Fair to say, Mark? Yeah, and, and that's actually pretty common for LTS releases. Dot one commonly includes the, the more dramatic changes. Dot two mm -hmm. is just incremental over dot one. Dot three is incremental over dot two. So yeah, this yep. is incremental over dot one. Right, and so let's, let's talk about that again just for a minute. If you've never joined us before on one of these videos, what is Jenkins LTS? Yeah, so the Jenkins long-term support release is a release that's issued up 12 times a year, so roughly once a month. And with those Jenkins long-term support releases, it's intentionally a stable release selected by the community based on community feedback and is used to deliver releases over a longer period. So whereas we typically do releases every week, Jenkins Weekly, long-term support is a once a month release, and we hold the same base release for a period of three months. So you'll commonly see version one, version dot two, and then version dot three before we roll to a new base release. So it is in fact focused on stability. We're worried that we want to be sure that the Jenkins user base has something that they can confidently deploy they can say, yes, we're ready to go, and it works great for us. Cool. Now, again, we did mention weekly. Weekly is sort of hopefully self-explanatory. It, it is. It's the tip, the tip of the master branch, and, and it delivers every week, and it has new features that it'll take a little longer before they, you're, you see them in LTS. And typically, weekly arrives on? Tuesday. 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 Mm -hmm. So not only do you get tacos on Tuesday, you also get a new Jenkins Weekly on Tuesday. That's right. And now and now LT, and LTS releases typically arrive on Wednesday, and that is quite intentional so that they are not on the same day. We, we, it we allows us to do better delivery. I never thought about that. I mean, yeah, I, I knew they didn't end up on the same day, but I didn't think about the reasons why. It's like, you, you were very polite. I'll be a little more blunt. Uh, you don't want to deal with two in one day. That's that's the blunt way to say it, and it's yes. a valid way to say it, right? If if we can avoid delivering weekly and LTS on the same day, it reduces reduces the burden on the release team. Yep, that might be another interesting conversation to have one day of what the release looks like. One for oh. because weekly is probably a subset of LTS, or is it the other way around? It's there's certainly Pro much, procedurally procedurally there's much less preparation required for a weekly than for an LTS. Okay. Weeklies don't get a change log. They don't get an upgrade or they get a change log. They don't get the dramatic change log that we give with LTS. They don't get any upgrade guide. So weeklies are lower ceremony intentionally, whereas LTS is higher ceremony because people need to know more information about what LTS releases. And let's go ahead and get into some of that ceremony today. All right. Now this this dot two was not primarily a security release, but there were a lot of security releases 
involved. Right. And, and that and that's important. When Jen, when Jenkins Core needs a security release, we want to be sure that we deliver it both for the weekly and for the long-term support line, and we deliver them concurrent. So this particular release on the same day we delivered an LTS security release 2.263.2, we also delivered a matching weekly security release 2.275. That way users, whether they're on weekly or on LTS, get the security release and the security release can be deployed with confidence in their environment. Okay. I am going to bring up the release notes for, I am going to, for the rest of the video for today, I'm just going to refer to it as dot two. I'm thankful like there's, I'm, I'm thankful it's only X dot Y dot Z yeah, and not A dot B dot C dot D dot E dot F. Um, so for anybody watching right now, if you hear me say dot two, we're talking about the full release 2.263.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, again, the big thing here was security. And there was an associated security advisory that was re was released with it. That's correct. And it has several, several entries in that security advisory. And I think for the benefit of our audience, let's go through those and we'll talk about them stepwise so that we yeah. can we can see and discuss, hey, what does this one mean? What does this one mean, et cetera? Yeah, and, and let me let me preface this with, you may have looked at security advisories before. And even if you haven't, I do wanna call out one thing here that is a little different than pretty much every other security release um, or recent ones that I've seen. This one, the very first bullet is Jenkins Core. We don't see a lot of Jenkins Core security type releases. Yeah, good point. And it's, right. it's, it's not uncommon for us to deliver a security advisory and the preceding, I think, two or three were security advisories which only gave advisories for specific plugins. Correct. And thanks to Jenkins's plugin architecture, if you're not don't have that plugin installed, you don't have to worry about a security advisory for a plugin you're not using. Uh, so it's it's nice in that when it's not a core release, you may in fact many times be able to ignore the security advisory because it's not touching a plugin that you're using. Right. But in this case, this is a Jenkins core security advisory and therefore you need to be aware of what this says and choose to move to 2.263.2 to dot two as soon as you can. Right. So let's go ahead and dig into some of these and I'll leave it up to you. I'll, I'll let you drive through these. I'll just super. Yeah. So the, the first is the is a cross site scripting vulnerability in the notification bar. And what the notification bar is, it's the the dialog box that pops up on the top of Jenkins of the Jenkins UI after I press a button like apply or after I have done some other action. And there are some cases where that bars contents could be controlled. And we don't want to allow cross-site scripting from someone who might have control of the contents of that notification bar text. So cross-site scripting is this, is this way that you, I can be persuaded without knowing it to take an action in my browser where it acts as though I am a, addressing a different website. And cross-site scripting vulnerabilities have become increasingly an attack vector for people wanting to steal my credentials and use them at a different site. And just because you're running inside of four walls doesn't mean you shouldn't care about cross-site scripting. Correct, right, because you could still be, it's it, anymore the, the particularly in the days of COVID-19 with people being many times working from home or working across a virtual private network, you're not always as guaranteed that the network boundaries you thought you had are in fact as solid and bulletproof as, as you would like them to be. So cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are good things to get resolved. Yep. We're not trying to insert fear here, but nope. just, just be aware that just because, hopefully your VPN is good, but if your VPN is split tunneled, it's not so good. Well, and and any if a if an attacker is inside your VPN by whatever means they got there, 
your VPN is now only your first line of defense. XSS safeguards are a good thing to have. Yep. Okay. So enough of that. We won't go into a whole lot of details. There were a couple of cross-site scripting ones here. We had one mm -hmm. on button labels. We had one on markup formatter. I'm basically, because each one of the, do you want to call out anything specific on either, any of these? Oh, actually, this one is a little bit interesting uh, for the markup formatter because you can override these fixes that were there. And that was one right. of the things we wanted to call out. Exactly. And and what you're what you're highlighting on the note is sometimes the, the security team realizes there may be valid cases where a consumer says, I cannot, I cannot tolerate the change that came from this security fix. I need to undo it for my specific case. And this is affectionately called an escape patch. The escape patch that you see on the note there allows an administrator to intentionally set a Java property on the command line that they use to start Jenkins. And now that is not convenient, it's not easy, and it's not trivial, and it's all intentionally that way. We, we want it to be a little hard to, to invoke one of these things because you are intentionally saying, I want to disable this safeguard that the code has in it to close a security gap. So, and, and the Java system properties that are there, there's an entire page of those on the Jenkins documentation about various things that can be enabled or disabled through system properties. Yep. So there were four or five cross-site scripting ones called right. out here. Uh, then we get into a deserialization error. Anything you want to talk about on this one? And again, deserializ deserialization is interesting in the sense that one of the things that Jenkins does is in order to store its information that has in memory, it writes it to disk. And it's pretty commonly that it's written as XML. And it does that by a term Java calls serialization. It serializes when it writes to disk and it deserializes when it reads from disk. And, and these deserialization vulnerabilities are a place where we don't want something getting into that data stream that does not belong there. And in this case, I believe this was an, is this the XXE one? I don't think so. No, okay, so this is this is just a deserialization error, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So we've done cross-site cross scripting, we have a deserialization, then we have this one, which is an right. arbitrary file read. Right, an arbitrary file read is is particularly scary because it may allow you using, when you exercise this, it may allow you to see things that you have no business seeing. And so so we don't want arbitrary file reads. That's, that's not a healthy thing to have. Yep. Uh, path traversals, again, this has another escape hatch on it. Right. So and be aware that if you start seeing weird things, because this one I thought was interesting, uh, based purely on an agent name. Right, that's kind of a like, novel one. Wait yeah. a sec, I can attack you by choosing a really strange agent, agent name. Yeah, that's yeah. an interesting, interesting reminder that there are all sorts of user or contributor controlled strings in the system, which when rendered or when used inappropriately when not sanitized perfectly could be a source of a security issue. Yep. Arbitrary file existence. Okay. Sort of the same as what we talked about before, roughly. Yeah, this uh, this one was would allow you to check for the existence of a file on the Jenkins controller file system by misusing the file fingerprint existence check. The one we all love, excessive memory allocation. Uh, this one was was interesting, purely around using the graph URL. Right. So this so this me, one was funny actually because I was mm -hmm. thinking, okay, why would I want a graph that's ten million pixels or exactly. twenty million? <laughs> okay, that's that's a different conversation that we won't get into today. Well, it, it reminds us that people who are 
desiring to attack a system may think well beyond the numbers you and I consider. This yes. this is very good example of exactly that. I would I have I don't have a screening or even every screen in my house still big enough to reasonably render a 10 million pixel image. But that doesn't matter because it's an interesting technique that someone could use to demand more memory from Jenkins than they should. Right. Uh, let's see, missing permission check. Can I just say facepalm? Um, <laughs> this is this is one of those this, tough ones, right? This 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 one is hard. Right. But it's what it is. So yeah. why, why don't we talk about, because it goes into the thing, there have to be some, as it says in the first sentence, there have to be some URLs that aren't under protection. Like Correct. the login screen, right? You, you got to be able to get to it. Before, you can't log in unless you can log in. Right. If, if a necessary precondition is you must authenticate before you authenticate, you will never authenticate. Right? That, sorry, the authentication has to allow access. Yeah, and I think if you scroll down a little further, sign up is yeah, another good one. If you yep. want to, if you decide to allow sign up, you have to allow them to not have already entered credentials in order to sign up. Yeah, it's so anyway, um, this has been fixed. But again, there's also another. There's an escape hatch. Would you classify this one as an escape hatch? I, I would, because okay. in general, you don't want to add things to that list unless you absolutely have to add them to it. You you really would prefer that Jenkins manage its own list of which things are not authenticated in terms of the set of URLs. Right. Basically, these should be the only ones and everything else should be denied. Right. Just, just whatever. Okay. So that is the end of all the Jenkins core. And then we get into a handful of interesting plug -in. ones. Yeah, just the plug-in ones. This is the one I always, I don't know the correct way to say it. Um, I've already used the face palm, so I can't use that one again. Maybe I chuckle a little bit. Um, well, this, this is, this, that text you highlighted is a reminder yeah. that sometimes programmers are programmers and they choose the simplest possible solution and in this case, the simplest possible solution is to write the credential directly to the disk without using a Java object. And the mm -hmm. problem with writing the credential directly to disk without using a Java object is it's plain text on the disk now. Correct. And again, I'm, I'm not calling this specific plugin out because I've seen this these first five words numbers of times. This Absolutely. Is, this is nothing new. Uh, it's just funny when I do see it, it's like, okay, you realize you're writing a plugin for Jenkins, right? And you realize there's actually a credentials subsystem inside of Jenkins already that you could just hook into. Well, and, and that's that's the other is many times plugin authors are starting from the knowledge they have, and they may sure. actually not be aware that there is a credential subsystem. And part of the exercise is to educate them and to teach them, hey, yes, there's a credential subsystem. Now we've got additional efforts going on right now in the community that the security team has actually enabled some opt-in additional checks for for issues that are can be like this, where commonly detected, often seen security problems can now be detected at the source code level if a plugin author subscribes to these particular checks. Well, that would make too much sense. Oh, it's 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 a really elegant thing, and of course. Jenkins plugin development is different, just like any large infrastructure, than other things. And so it has a unique set of failure modes that we can, that the security team has written a series of checks for. And thanks to Daniel Beck, have deployed them. And they're they are interesting, useful, and helpful. In fact, I think it was one or two security advisories ago, we published quite a number of oh, yeah. plugin issues that were detected by the tool. Right. It was, that was a great one. Not that we want to say great having a security. Right. It, release, it's, but. it's good when machinery finds things instead of attacking human beings, right? We like yes. it when machinery finds things. Yep. Uh, again, another cross-site scripting in this plugin and another stored in plain text. Mm -hmm. and, and that was everything in this security release.
the, the, or in this security advisory, I should say. Uh, each of the classifications are here, and also the thank yous are down here in the credits and stuff. So if, if you've never taken the chance to take a look at a security advisory, I, I recommend it. If you're, if you're in charge of actually maintaining your Jenkins infrastructure, you probably want to take a look at this and understand it. Right. And specifically, do you need to get to 263.2? The answer is yes. Yes. Do you just go and install it without validating it? Oh, no. Well, that, that depends on your risk level, right? Right. If, if it's business critical to you, you probably shouldn't, just like you wouldn't yeah. do many other things. It's, if you get to the reason, the, the primary reason I'm saying, oh, no, this time, like even a, in, in that business case scenario or your risk level, is because of these known escape hatches, mm -hmm. right? I, it's been a long time since I've seen an escape hatch come in. And, and this, so, these are good reasons to test test before you deploy. Absolutely, wholehearted so, agreement. So let's let's put it this way: if I see a security release for a plugin, I, I would probably be a little more aggressive being able to get it in. I wouldn't wouldn't think as much about it. But taking a look at this advisory, I would say, hmm, okay, there's five, six different items in the advisory. Okay, not a big deal. Four of them have escape hatches because you might not want what happens. Hmm, okay, I need to think about this one a little bit differently. Even though typically I'm not risk averse or I am not risk averse. Mm -hmm. right, it's so this you is, need to this be informed. Good, good place to read the security advisory, think about what it means, and consider which of my use cases might be affected yeah. by this. Yep. Okay. Um, a few other things that were in this change log. There was one for the help text now expands in GitHub org folders. I actually saw that one. That was pretty oh. funny. Okay. You, yeah, it, it didn't expand before which in, if you look in behaviors, behaviors can be very um, helpful. Let's put it that way. Yes. Uh, but if you can't see the help for them and understand what they are, they're not very helpful. Right. Sometimes the five word explanation is not enough. And, and, and there's a reason we write that help text. And sometimes it's a page or more of help text there trying to help the consumer understand, oh, this is what this is, will do for me. Yes. So, all right. So we won't spend any more time on that. Now, the next three items were security hardening related. And I thought this was interesting because this is another one that is starting to come to the forefront, I believe, based on what we were just talking about with what Daniel introduced a while back. Mm -hmm is that we're now able to have some automation to help find these things that makes it easier instead of a human digging for hours. Right. It's there. What they security hardening is a far form of safeguard that can protect us from, from other mistakes, right? The benefit of a security hardening is it's a safety measure just in case something else didn't work the way it was desired. And security hardening has been a long-standing practice in, in many of the operating systems, for instance. They work very hard to think about what if a programmer made this class of mistake, is there a way we could safeguard against that mistake in our own code, in the core code? And that's the kind of thing that security hardening is doing for us. So we won't go through, well, we'll touch on each one of these. Form validation responses, that's a good one right? Because form validation is always a pain. But notice, again, escape hatch. Mm -hmm. Digester. Right, again, this one is a, that one's a, a safeguard against yeah. XML processing. Yeah, this, and, this is the XXE that we were thinking about earlier. Right. And what it's doing is saying, okay, if a maliciously, a, a carefully crafted malicious XML content is being passed in, this is helping to safeguard that it won't do things it should not do. Right. And then the last one, label names. Really? <laughs> label Isn't that names? Great? Yeah. So 
if I label my agent maliciously, and, and and there are some Jenkins environments, for instance, where the they're all friends, right? We're all we're all friends with each other, and we're going to let you donate your compute power to Jenkins during the evening while your computer's sitting on your desk and you're at home. It, I, I'm used to it being called a swarm. And you could donate, but the problem is if that swarm client has a maliciously named label, you could suffer issues. And this is helping to safeguard against that kind of malice. Right. Label names? Yeah, isn't that great? It's like, really? Wow. But again, going back to what I was ranting about a moment ago, each one of these have escape hatches. They do. Treat an escape hatch as part of your process to figure out, okay, how aggressive am I going to be upgrading this without full testing or some level of testing, whatever, whatever that may be for you. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, when the development team decides to insert an escape hatch, that's a good indicator for the rest of us. I should probably look around this area a little more carefully. Yeah. Yep. Like for me, I have, my I upgraded my Jenkins this morning. Mm -hmm. I'm running on a Raspberry Pi inside my four walls on the, at the house. Yes, it runs on a Raspberry Pi 3. It's not fast, but it runs. Mm -hmm. And it was fine because it's like, oh, okay, I've got like four jobs on it. If it breaks, I fix it. Mm -hmm. I don't have critical things running on it. So my, my risk tolerance is very low or very high, I guess. Okay. And, and my upgrade yesterday with the several thousand jobs that I have still was, was went just great. The upgrade of ci.jenkins.io that went to 2.263.2 yesterday also went just great. So, so we've got large scale production systems that are using .2 and using it quite successfully. But it, it's a reminder that this is a good reason to evaluate and think about this upgrade a little more than you might have thought about one that isn't a security advisory release. Correct. And then there were just a couple of other items in the notes here. Populate select fields with default values, uh, some wrong yeah. Unicode characters. That's not... And then there was this internal one, upgrading node to the latest LTS for node, which was 14.15.1. Right. And, and internal in general, most people can ignore, right? It, internal, yeah. the word really means that it is purely internal to the, likewise for developer topics. Most people are not Jenkins plugin developers or Jenkins core developers. And so for them, internal and developer as flags there are not, not particularly crucial. Okay. So we've been through this. And if you watched last month's around 263.1, we were talking about the upcoming March release. And we would be remiss if we did not hammer that home a little bit more. Because we've only got one more LTS for 263, which will be the February release. And then March arrives. That's correct. Now, if you don't know what we're talking about, I am going to pull up this blog post that Mark published in November of 2020 that goes through four, can we say huge? Four dramatic, significant. Dramatic. Yeah, they, and they are. All four of them are significant changes. So taking a look at these, and we're going to go into these not necessarily in depth, but we're also not going to gloss over them. So let's go through these again one more time, top to bottom. If you're not aware of these, we're not going to make you go back and watch the video for dot one. We're going to go through it again here right now for dot two, mm -hmm. because this this is critical as we're moving towards March. Right. So if you're if you're already running weeklies, you're already going through all this. Right. In fact, right. we should, we should express our gratitude and our our hope that those who are weekly users will continue to tell us as they encounter issues. Yes. Because we, we love that weekly is already running all of these capabilities. Yes. All four of these changes are already visible and, and we're very grateful to weekly users who are reporting 
surprises or issues that they encounter in any of these areas. But if you don't want to be one of those people that wants to be surprised or have to report things, stay on LTS. Well, and or or intentionally deploy a small weekly that you can use to test your environment somewhere else. Yeah. Right. Don't you, if you, Not I'm an LTS user, I intentionally stay on LTS, but I test weekly periodically to see how close is it to my my LTS? What are the surprises? Yep. Okay. Let's get into this top one first for tables to divs. I am going to pull up. Uh, did I not pull that one up? I didn't. That was the hardener. Oh, hmm. I thought I had. Okay. We'll do, do that real quick. So tables to divs. What is it? Why is it important? Go. Yeah. So Jenkins, when it was created 15 years ago, used HTML tables as its predominant layout mechanism. And 15 years ago, that was a great way to do layout. And the layouts were dramatically better than most of the web pages I was seeing at that day and that time. However, as time has gone, gone forward and as web browser technologies advance, we found better ways to do things. Whereas before, our screens were almost universally in a certain range of narrow range of sizes. Now our screen sizes vary radically from the web browser on my cell phone to the web browser on a 30 inch monitor that is sitting on a desktop and tables to divs. This is a transition from using table based HTML markup to using HTML divs to show the layout of these pages. And now the layout of the pages is illustrated pretty nicely in that web page. Why don't we take a look at that Darren? And let's, let's show that again. Okay. So you want to go back to... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. That's me. I, I was getting ready for the next one, but I'll open this up again. Okay. So we're right here. Yeah. So here what you see is this is, this is how it used to look. If you look at the right-hand edge of that screen, you'll see truncation of the edges of that thing. Those fields flow beyond the edge of the screen. And in order to get to them, you have to horizontally scroll inside your web browser. It is messy, inconvenient and difficult to read. So we see here, it says default M2 repository or the value of local rep something. And it's right. stopped. Now, so, new layout, there it is. It fits. And I know that this, the modern, modern web people say, of course it fits, but I'm deeply grateful this change is coming and it's coming in a way that works with the large Jenkins plugin infrastructure with the, the set of plugins. So we're working through the process of adapting things to this transition. Okay. So that's tables to divs. Right. All right. Next up is Spring Security replacing a CG. Right. And, and this one is, this one and the one that follows it are both beautiful examples of progress in the technical implementation of Jenkins. Jenkins, many years ago, took a, a, a baseline copy of the Spring Security Library's predecessor, SCG, and used it as a fork and stabilized on it. It's worked well, good, good nice, reliable behavior. However, it was now being flagged regularly by, by security scanners as, oh, there's a risk because you're running an out-of-date library. Well, Jesse Glick has successfully switched the core security framework from using this a CG unmaintained library that we had forked to using the standard Spring Security Library. So we get all the benefit of the Spring communities work to secure their library. And that's a good thing. That is unforking. Removing removing forks like this as an enormous amount of work that we hope users never detect. We we want to make it seamless, but more important, we need to be sure that we are up to date with provider libraries so we don't have to write everything ourselves. Right. And in using the word unfork, let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is the Xtreme unfork. Right. So so Jenkins uses XML files heavily and uses a serialization technique called a serialization library called Xtreme. That serialization library allows us to write Java objects to the disk and then read those Java objects back from the disk 
And that library had been forked a number of years ago because there was some disagreement between the Jenkins community and the extreme maintainers. The problem with choosing to do a fork is that now we're being, again, in this case, flagged by scanners saying, oh, you're running an out of date version. So what Jesse had to do here was actually resolve the disagreements between the upstream maintainers of Xtreme and Jenkins usage. Thankfully, there were a number of changes that had been made several years ago that were well aligned with how Xtreme was already doing things. So Jesse's work went forward and it's now available in weekly releases and will be coming in the March release of the LTS. Okay. And one final one. I have to laugh. A jQuery upgrade? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And again, it's the same story, right? We had been using a 1.x version of jQuery and it was time to switch to a new version. Now, it was inside the core of Jenkins, and therefore Felix, who did the work, had to be very careful to be sure that he identified the places, made changes. There were actually, if I recall correctly, some plugins that had to be updated. Also, that this jQuery upgrade could move from an outdated version to the current release of jQuery. And I am really pleased this one, along with Xtreme, have actually both received recent pull requests to the Jenkins code base offering to update to a new minor version. And that new minor version upgrade was seamless and smooth. So the this work that Jesse and the Felix have done has been very helpful already to the weekly releases. And we're looking forward to it being available in LTS in March. jQuery. It's jQuery. That's, that's all hey. I'll say. Hey, it works. It, it does. Works. And that's, that's fine. I'm not a big JavaScript fan, if you haven't figured out. I can, I, I'm good with Java because that's only four levers. JavaScript adds another five. So it's a little bit harder to use. Got it. Um, okay. That's pretty much it. March is coming. These last four items that we just went over, if you're not ready for them, and you, when you upgrade, not if, but when you upgrade to whatever that version number is going to be, which will probably be, what, a 180-ish type number. It'll probably be in that block, late 170s, 180s. Actually, two dot, well, so we just shipped 2.275, and we'll choose oh. the next release at the end of at end of January. Oh, so we we'll have at least, yeah. well, at least two more. So it's think it somewhere likely in the 2.270 range. 270 range, okay. So whatever that is, um, and you go to upgrade in March, I'm, I'm being polite now. Don't say we didn't tell you. Right. Well, and, and now is the time to help us, right? Yes, now is the time please do. Check weeklies to be sure yep. that the plugins that matter to you in your organization work well with the current weeklies. 2.275 is a great weekly version to evaluate. It's, it's smooth. And if you have issues and you detect issues in it, this is the time to report those issues so people can work on them. Okay, Mark, you are on Twitter. I am. Mark E. Wait. So if you have any questions that you would like to run by Mark, you can do that. Reach out to him. Um, anything else big? We'll be back again in February when the next LTS comes out. We'll usually, usually do the show a day after the release, just so Mark isn't pulling his hair out same day. Uh, of course, in, in February, would you be on the slopes at that point? Probably not. No, 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 not not a skier. And oh, okay. grateful, grateful to grateful and happy to be available. So look forward okay. to having a conversation in February and looking forward again to talking in March. Cool. Thanks, Mark. We will see you again in February. Mm -hmm. And we will again be reiterating March is coming. That's right. March is coming. So Mark, we will talk to you later. I'm gonna boot you out real quickly. And Thanks for hanging out with us today. If this video was helpful for you, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to CloudBeast TV, go ahead and click on that subscribe button right down over there and ring that bell to be able to be notified anytime we have new content for you. Again, my name was Darren Pope. If you want to follow up 
also with us on Twitter. You can follow up with us on Cloud Bees Devs, or and I don't have a lower third for it. My name is Darren Pope on Twitter. So thanks again for joining us today. If you have any questions, please reach out, let us know. Go ahead and start testing on that weekly, not in production, so you can be ready for March when it does arrive. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will talk to you again in about a month for the next LTS.